Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Simon Rattle. Uh, we're going to have a chat about various uh, aspects of Baroque music. As we're with Bach, we should um, explore uh, our work with that great composer um, throughout the years. I mean, you had done the Passions from quite early on. Did you, had you not? Not really. Uh, I, although I always loved Bach, it's really, it's very difficult to conduct this music on your knees. Uh, and it took a really dear friend of mine, uh, Katia Lebeck, to basically force me to look for, God's sake, Simon, this is ridiculous. You must do this music. You need this in your life. Uh, and so she helped me actually to really go for, uh, really go for this as I started doing it with some, some Brandenburgs again, mm -hmm. having, because you know, I'd done them as a young conductor in, in a time where I didn't know what to tell orchestras and I basically couldn't stand what came out. It was still in a very 1960s, mm. Ta, 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 ta. Everything was very equal. And yes. as, as, so I went back and I went back to this. And the in Berlin, although we had done a, a little bit of Baroque music, the real plunge came uh, via the Maverick Opera and theatre director, Peter Sellers, uh, who we decided uh, the story is too long to tell, uh, but there was a moment where our professional chorus, the Berliner Rundfunk chorus, came to me, having met Peter for the first time all, almost by accident, uh, and he had burst into tears in front of them and said all kinds of swear words that they weren't quite sure what he meant. Uh, they said, whoever this man is, we think he's extraordinary and we want to work with him. And so I asked Peter, well, what can we do? He said, look, this is not an opera chorus. These are not theatre people. This is a radio choir. They're German and they're East German. So we must, it's, it's either the Beethoven Missa Solemnis, which is the most difficult piece in the world, I thought to myself, what, uh, or it's the Matthew Passion. And I went, oh my God, it's the second most difficult piece. <laughs> and so I chose the Bach. Uh, yeah. because I knew even if I couldn't master it, I could love it and understand it. I still don't understand the Mr. Solemnist to this day, magnificent though it is. Mm. And we decided that everybody would learn it from memory. Uh, the chorus, all the orchestra soloists, not the, not the entire orchestra. Uh, and that we would have weeks to work on it and it would be done basically like an opera. And it was probably the single most important thing we did for the development of the orchestra in every way in Berlin. Because the effect that Peter has and the effect that Bach has is that nobody could say, oh, listen to how wonderfully we're playing. Aren't we brilliant virtuosos? All that had to be left yes. at the door. And you were faced just with this material. Mm. Uh, and when I he'd been working with the chorus already for a week by the time I came in. Uh, and I found it very emotional. One of the chorus said, oh, Simon, don't worry. If you, need, if you feel you need to weep, We've all been doing this. Just go out for a couple of minutes and weep and come back. Mm. Uh, and the same thing happened when the orchestra came in. Uh, I have still this picture in my mind in the first performance of watching a rather tough uh, genius of a first flute, uh, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Pahoud, playing the last chorus with tears streaming down his face. Uh, so we were faced with this material and how how you do it and what does it mean? And of mm. course, Peter can get to everybody's deepest and darkest points. This is this is part of his genius. Yeah. And when I ran out of musical things to say, 
for instance, in the extraordinary soprano aria in the Matthew with the flute and the two cor anglais. I couldn't get the cor anglais to play as I wanted. He just very quietly walked to them and said, you sound too healthy. This is, um, this is somebody's heart about to stop beating. Don't make it equal, just let it falter. Immediately a picture, immediately whatever you needed. Yeah. Uh, and of course- Ibama dish, I mean, of Ibama dish, I mean, of an extraordinary piece, possibly the center, the, the most touching piece of all with violin and uh, mezzo. He produced it with Christ's grave in the middle, as though this community of people were coming back to relive the story year after year. Uh, and he got the leader of the orchestra to sit on the grave and play the violin solo. And Magdalena uh, Kojena, my wife, to just simply barefoot kneel at his feet and sing to him. Uh, and Daniel Stabrava, the leader, he didn't know he could do it because in fact, he'd had a quartet, the Philharmonia Quartet in the orchestra for 30 years and the cellist had died very unexpectedly a few months before. Uh, he didn't think he could play it from memory. He didn't think he could, he could emotionally manage it. Mm -hmm. And what came out was this extraordinarily touching conversation between, with Daniel lamenting and Magdalena trying to say, yes, it will be okay. And it seemed to tell us all so much about not only the music, but the life we were living. Thank you. 
So that was um, the aria, a Barmadik from Bach's and Matthew Passion, sung by Magdalena Kojina and the, conducted by Simon Rattle with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we've become so immersed in this uh, in this way of doing early music, that it's now become almost second nature. When we used to go to orchestras and have to talk, as I was saying earlier, to say, oh, please not this and please not that, there was an awful lot of not, don't, don't do this, don't do that. Now when you go, I find, and this is, certainly true of an orchestra that I've worked with for so long, like Music of the Baroque, but even orchestras I go to for the first time, they, you hardly ever use the V word, vibrato, hardly ever have to. Sometimes they ask you, what's, what is it? What do we do about vibrato? Um, and also you, 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 you've bowed it. So you don't, you, you don't have to, uh, you don't ask them, oh, can you change the bowing? You need to be, I mean, in my experience, they have to be playing from my, my material. You have to be prepared, yes. Yeah, you have to have that. So th that immediately gets the articulation that you, you want. And you're now talking m about the music, not about how to play early music. You're talking about the the syntax, the grammar, the, 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 just the conversation, how, how music flows uh, and full stops, commas, there just has to have all that. That's what, you're, um, that's what you're adding to the experience of the sound. I mean, the sound, obviously there's so many different sounds you can go for, but I mean, um, it, it's one of those things that it just seems to be happening without a great deal of conversation. Isn't that but right? I think people have it in their ears now. 
If I could tell you, I mean, what I thought was an incredibly sweet story, the very first time I did any Baroque music in Berlin was uh, way before, I mean, the, in the early years of Claudio Abbado, the, in the 80s, I went to do the Boreard suite as ever. Uh, and at the end of the rehearsals, the oldest cellist of uh, the four, I think I allowed to play, he came up and said, you know, Simon, Whenever I hear Baroque music played like this on the radio, I always switch off. But you know, it's actually, it's rather fun to play like this. <laughs> and I, and I, I said to him, well, but, and maybe, well, that's wonderful to hear. And maybe next time you hear it on the radio, you, you won't switch off. He said, well, that might be true. And yeah. I thought, oh, there is a chink of light here. Yes. But you know, now it is in, it is in people's ears and what's extraordinary is of course the music doesn't change but our perception of it changes yep. and you know, what is horrifying is to listen back to things that I felt were incredibly stylish 30 or 40 years ago and not be able to listen to them and it's always even worse when it's kind of conducted by yourself Yes, I don't know. Know. Why did I do this? And we thought we were doing so well. But yes. it, 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 and of course, the, the music will show a different face to us each time. <laughs> and we have to expect, you know, ju just as you know, my 15 year old keeps on saying, you know, Dad, you're just far too liberal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure, you know, sometimes it's going to be, God, you're really far too old fashioned Baroque, aren't you? Uh, yeah. It, it will change. Yes. And music we've been doing for years, you know, for years and years and years is changing your, our, our perception of it. You know, you know, Messiah, for instance, which I do every year, have done for about 30 or 40 years. It's changed over the years because you realize you look behind the notes and you realize the possibilities are are endless. I mean, the, the, the possibilities of this combination of notes that are on the page, it just, you can do it so many different ways. And I think the thing is also that the great thing has we, we have realized how free early music is. And in, uh, I mean, much more, much more free than most later music. Yeah. Uh, and it's, well, it's more akin to jazz in yeah. that way. And yes. that you need a lot of that. You need a lot of that spirit. Yes. So I'm going to introduce a piece which has become, has sort of almost defined me at, um, at Music of the Baroque because I did it for my audition. I've only done one audition and that was for Music of the Baroque. And I didn't get the job, but they, they didn't want to see the back of me so they decided to give me the associate which I was very happy about and still am um, and it, the piece that I that I did for that which was quite a dangerous choice was Handel's Dixit Dominus. Dangerous because it's very very difficult it's very hard to sing chor chorally um, and it's a sort of virtuosic you know, Handel never wrote anything like it after. He wrote it when he was uh, 22. And, um, and I always say to audiences, what were you doing at 22? You know, I mean, really, it, it's so outrageous. And but isn't it wonderful? I mean, it's like Mozart and Idomeneo. Before anyone had told him, you can't do that. Yes. Or before he'd had the first lousy performance that had made him realize, I'd better not do that again. No, that's right. But it sort of came off and um, it, it has, and I, I've done Dixit Dominus, I've, I've performed three times over the 20 years that I've been with Music of the Rock. And we're going to play uh, an excerpt from the last performance I did, which sort of everything sort of seemed to come together. Um, so here it is. Uh, played and sung by Music of the Baroque.
So that was part of Handel's Dixit Dominus, uh, sung and played by music of the Baroque. So one thing that um, I had the great privilege of doing uh, some years back now is to travel to Venezuela at your invitation. Um, and it was an extraordinary experience just for so many reasons, because um, for one thing, both of our families went together. Um, um, you know, we've known them and you've known mine ever since they were born, uh, my children that is. And um, we had a holiday quite apart from anything else. But the work that, the work with the, the kids that you did, which we watched and experienced, was absolutely mind boggling. So this is the uh, Sistema, the famous um, orchestra that uh, was formed out of a sort of training program uh, begun, what, how many years ago? 50, 40, 45? 40 years, probably. Yes. Um, and um, has blossomed into the most incredible um, way of approaching training and learning how to play music, learning instruments and putting orchestras together. And of course, the, the net result is that it's quite different from the, uh, any way that orchestras play. Um, and that was quite obvious from the very first time I saw them rehearsing with you, uh, I don't know what it was, Brahms or something. Um, the, the fact is that, that they are so physical, so physically involved with the music. They can't sit still, I mean, they don't sit still and um, nor should they be encouraged to. Um, I mean, even when they're playing, you know, the West Side Stories dance, West Side Story dances, they get on on their chairs and and start sort of <laughs> dancing about. But even when they're not playing that, even when they're playing Brahms, when they're playing uh, what else do we hear uh, Shostakovich, and then when I did I did a bit of Dixit Dominus as well, they just were living the music. And I mean, as a spectator. This is what an orchestra has to be like. And I'm afraid it had such an effect on me that I then had to talk to orchestras about it and say, look, you cannot just sit there and play. They, they can buy a CD if they want to hear the music, but they're coming to watch you and you have to show, you have to show the phrasing. I mean, no, I mean look, it's interesting because of course there was a, a, a a number of generations of American music uh, uh, orchestras who were told not to move. Yeah. And I think it's particularly string players who were under the thrall of Heifetz, who famously didn't move, but made this extraordinary sound. Mm. And, and, and I had this experience of little people who would, young musicians who would come into an orchestra and everybody would call them Bob because they were mm. moving around so much and they would stop. Yeah. But the idea that you show the music yeah. is yeah. terribly important. I mean, the tragic thing in Venezuela is that we are talking about it in the past sense, is yeah. that this no longer exists in this, uh, in, in the brutality of the regime, which there is now. Uh, even uh, Gustavo has not been able to uh, go down. I mean, Maduro told him uh, publicly, uh, if you come back to, to Venezuela, just be careful where you go. I mean, this is basically a sentence of death. But the musicians are, are now all over the world, but not in Venezuela. That's but right. at its height, there were half a million people playing in youth orchestras, more than were doing organized sports in the country. And of yeah. course, it has been, it is probably the most inspiring youth music uh, work I have seen. Yes. and probably could only be done in a country where people had little or nothing. Yes. Uh, uh, where, where there were not other things to distract in yeah. that way. Yeah. Uh, completely unforgettable experience that I'm still in touch with uh, yeah. a number of the people, of yeah. course. Uh, 
who yeah. are as they are grown up now as any musicians ever get. But yeah. the idea of physicality, but you know, in Baroque music, there was always this. Yes, that's right. Uh, and you know, this, this is fascinating. Uh, and the, this, this is something that helps because you physically show where the music goes. It also helps you to play it. Well, I, I, I would say that we learn so much from our players, from our orchestral musicians. Um, and long may that be because um, it's, it's a sort of mutual learning all the time. I learn, I learn from, I, I mean, this is one of the things I, f I find anyway, is that I never ever stop learning. Um, I go and listen to a performance of yours and there's something that I will come away with that I hadn't thought of before. I mean, whatever it is, however small it is, but it is something. And that's what musicians have to be. That's how well, we, we should have... all be stealing joyfully from each other all the time. On that note, I, th I just have to say thank you so much, Simon. For well, it's, uh, it's wonderful. I mean, I'm sorry I can't hug you here. I know. We're all very happy that you were able to do this. And... My very best wishes for starting your concert life again, which people need so much. I think we, we will all have to fight for we pray that it's as soon as possible. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.